Um, it's a real pleasure to be at, at Cal State San Bernardino. This is my first visit to the campus, actually. So um, it's it's amazing that the mountains out here are much larger when you get up close. <laughs> From Santa Monica, they look really small. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Chow and I uh, go way back, two years. <laughs> uh, we first met as part of a delegation of American scholars uh, who visited Taiwan as guests of the foreign ministry. And uh, quite an eye-opening eye trip, I thought. It was my first time to visit Taiwan, um, having gone to China so many times. Um, state capitalism is a term we hear thrown around, and I'll talk about that a little bit. What exactly does state capitalism mean? What is capitalism when you put that word state in front of it? Um, and then cars, of course, has to do with the research that I've done. My own research was in the automobile industry in China, and uh, I used that research to try to get at um, these broader questions about China. So with that, let's just go ahead and get into it. Um, this is a very simple graph. Um, and every presentation should have at least one graph, right? Um, what we're looking at here is just very simple gross domestic product in China and in the United States. The only thing I really want to point out here, this, is, this covers the uh, period of time from about uh, 1980 to 2012, basically China's uh, reform period, which began around 1978. The important thing to point out here is the red line here China, in 1980, the size of its GDP was about 7% of the United States. By 2012, it was 53% of the United States. So if you imagine these lines being drawn further into the future, um, at some point, China will cross the United States and keep on going, if you believe that all lines that slope upward slope upward forever, um, which if you look back in history, that is not always the case. But this is, this is the kind of thing that makes people ask this question, is China winning? You may have heard in the news um, just a few days ago, um, as the Chinese have observed the political shenanigans that have been going on in Washington, uh, Xinhua, China's uh, media conglomerate, put out a big editorial asking the question, um, maybe it's time we de-Americanize the world. Um, so these sorts of questions um, maybe give us pause for thought. What's China doing that makes them think they can say something like this? And what are, what's China doing that makes them grow so fast? So we'll get into that a little bit. But in practical terms, what does it look like? Well, if you've been in Shanghai in 1987, looking across the Huangpu River at this area called Pudong, this is what you would have seen. If you go there today, this is what you see. <laughs> Late 80s, today. Late 80s, today. So within the stretch of about three decades, or actually less, the Chinese have built their own Manhattan. Um, the question is, what's going on in those buildings? Is anything worthwhile going on in those buildings? Is anything creative or innovative or profitable going on in those buildings? That gets back to the question, is China winning? Uh, that skyscraper that's under construction um, will be the second tallest building in the world um, after the big one in Dubai. So state capitalism. We hear this term capitalism a lot. We all sort of know that in the US we are capitalist, although we may not actually be able to define it. Um, what exactly is capitalism, just without the state? There are of course, many varieties of capitalism, different kinds of capitalism, different forms, but two essentials, really. You've got a private sector, so the factors of production, land, labor, and capital, technology, tend to be concentrated in private hands, not government or state hands. Secondly, you've got markets, um, the prices of things in the stores, how much gets produced, these decisions aren't made by the government. They're made by supply and demand in the market. So there's competition among the players in the market. This is sort of a very rough definition of capitalism. And every country, of course, has its own way of doing capitalism. But if you put that word state in front of it, that adds a few things. And unsurprisingly, it adds the word state. The state becomes the dominant player. 
um, the state embraces markets. The state likes markets. The state has figured out that markets are a good thing. They like the fact that markets can generate money, can generate economic growth. But at the same time, they're a little bit afraid of markets. They're a little bit afraid of things that may get out of control, things that are not completely controllable by the state. So they'll put barriers around what the market can accomplish. So the markets are much less free. Um, you have heavy state ownership, a lot of state-owned companies in China. Um, even though the private sector in China now, depending on how you measure it, um, is probably more than half of China's economy. And again, the line between state and private in China is quite blurry. It's, it's not one and zero. It tends to be one, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. I mean, you know, it, there are degrees of state involvement in the economy in China. It's not just one or zero. Um, but what the key here for China is that the biggest companies in the most important industries are owned by the state. And that's the real key. Um, and you have a big apparatus for economic planning. So you've got this big organization in Beijing, and they don't, they don't tell everybody what they should charge for everything, although they do, although they do in some cases. Um, China's economic planning apparatus never was as, as big and as extensive as was the one in the Soviet Union. They didn't try to plan as much. Um, and now they plan even less. The Chinese are trying to move away from this command economy, but they still maintain this apparatus. Um, the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission, um, the, the Chinese shorthand is uh, Fog Ai Wei. Um, this is the organization that is responsible for sort of macroeconomic planning and policy. They ensure that every industry complies with China's overall economic direction as decided by the leaders of the party. So getting into my research a little bit, sort of setting the stage, is China winning? Is this state capitalism thing really as great as we, as it would appear to be? I started to ask some, some questions as I began my research in China. And I looked at, I mean, having been a, you know, I, I moved to, to China in the mid-90s and lived there for a couple of years, and had periodically traveled back and forth quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> over all those years, I, I watched China, I looked at China, and I saw it go from a poor country to a very clearly, solidly middle-income country. Um, and if you, you know, that first graph I showed you, just the rapid increase, the rapid growth. One of these questions I started asking was, well, if state ownership is such a bad thing, as we in the West tend to think, how come China's doing so well? Well, they shouldn't be. If state ownership is a bad thing, China should be performing badly, right? So it's one of those kinds of questions that make you scratch your head. And the implications <clears throat> of the answer to this question are also pretty interesting. Is China breaking the rules or are they rewriting them? In other words, is China doing something that later they will have to pay a price for? Are they getting away with breaking rules temporarily? Or have they come up with some magical formula that the rest of us don't understand and are unable to copy? Will, that, will those red bars continue to go up forever as the blue bars begin to stagnate? Um, I think these are pretty important questions. And so these sort of launched me into my research. Being only one person, um, not having a gigantic research staff to send all throughout China. I chose a single industry. Um, it was quite fortuitous. Um, I chose the automobile industry because the autom automobile industry has a good variety of ownership forms. You've got state-owned companies, you've got private Chinese companies, you've got foreign companies, and you've got the state all interjected in there. So the interaction of these various players, I was interested to see how that worked. What could I learn from and I'll go ahead and sort of give you the answer up front in terms of what I found. And then I will give you some, uh, some case studies and stories that sort of back this up. This is, I call this macro findings from a micro study. So I looked micro, I looked at a single industry. 
But as I went throughout China talking to people, reading documents, looking into the archives, the kinds of questions I asked were, what does this mean for China as a whole? What does this say about how China as a whole operates, how China's industrial model works? And so I, got, I, I took a micro look, but then I looked for answers that would have implications for, for China writ large. The first finding here um, is that China's model has been effective, very effective. There's no denying that China has grown 10% a year um, in a, on average for about three decades. That's just astounding. That's quite impressive. But it's beginning to show signs of losing its effectiveness. And toward the end, I'll talk about what that means and uh, where the Chinese will be able to go from there. The second point, um, oh, and, and by the way, by effectiveness here, um, I should probably define that. Um, what I mean by effectiveness is simply growth and gross domestic product. There are lots of different ways to, to define effectiveness, of course. Um, to be honest, I would personally question using GDP as the sole measure of effectiveness. Um, there are many other ways. I mean, it doesn't even get into whether people are happy and healthy and those sorts of questions. But just in, in terms of sheer economic growth, this is what we're talking about, whether it's driving economic growth. Um, the second point here is that in China, politics always trumps economics. And I will have to apologize for using the weasel word almost. Um, but the fact is, it's tough to make declarative statements about China um, because you can almost always find exceptions to, to your rule. But in general, in China, I think we find most of the time that polit politics trumps economics. You might even be able to say this about any country, but I'm talking about China today. Um, now, what this means about politics trumping economics, this is based on goals. The central government of China has this one overarching goal that's more important than anything else, and that is the continued rule of the Communist Party. That is goal number one. That, that goal does not change. It's not even up for debate. It is sacrosanct. And China watchers the world over will agree that this is goal number one. Now, there are other objectives that feed into that, of course, other ways of trying to accomplish that. There are many things you can do below that overarching goal in terms of running a country. But there are two primary pillars that support that goal. One is economic growth, and the other is social stability. So these two things are, have been determined by pretty much everybody. Again, almost, it's almost as sacrosanct as that overarching goal. Economic growth and social stability underpin the continued rule of the Communist Party. And what we will see is that so social stability, however, in terms of politics is more important than economic growth. And when push comes to shove, social stability outranks economic growth. And I will, um, I will give you some uh, examples of how that works in, in practical ways. Um, the third point is that central government still gets what it wants. This is um, back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of people were saying, well, the central government is reforming. They're pushing a lot of authority down to local governments. Central government's pushing authority down to local governments, authority over budgets and things like that, taxes and spending. And with that goes a lot of power. Central government's giving up a lot of power. Well, that is true. But the central government all along has maintained the single most important lever of power, and that's control over personnel. Who gets promoted, who gets hired, who gets fired. The Communist Party is an organization that works in parallel with the government. So you've got central government, and you've got the Communist Party organs at the central level. And in fact, the president of China, Xi Jinping, is also the Communist Party Secretary General. So in that sense, he's his own boss, which is kind of nice for him. Um, then you've got local governments, and at the local level, you've got <coughs> Communist Party organs that oversee and further down, so provincial level, uh, cities, counties, all the way down to villages. You've got a party organ that oversees 
the state. And what's important here is the way this organization works is it ensures that those that overarching goal and those pillars that support it work their way all the way down from top to bottom. That's how they ensure that people at the bottom know what to do. They have to please the people above them, who have to please the people above them, who have to please the people above them. It's not a perfect system, but in general it works, because the activities you see going on down at the bottom, even if they don't truly support those pillars, they appear very much to be supporting those pillars, because people want to keep their jobs or to even move up. They want to be seen to follow those goals. The important thing with this particular point is that even when you see an instance in which the central government appears not to be getting what it wants, if you just dig a little further, you find out that indeed it is getting what it wants most of the time. <coughs> now, this next point, the first three points are really the most important points from this presentation. The next two are sort of bonus points. They came out of my research, and they're interesting and they're important, I think, but I'm, I will spend less time on them. But the, uh, the, the fourth point is that farm firms pay a price for being in China. As you can imagine, this has something to do with intellectual property. Um, and the final one is that China faces a dilemma between consumer aspirations and sustainability. This gets into the environment. Um, the automobile industry, as you well know, um, has not exactly been friendly to the environment over the years, although it is becoming somewhat more friendly nowadays. China is still in the thick of everybody acquiring cars now. So before I get into the, um, the, the thick of my, uh, uh, my research, <clears throat> I'm just going to tell you about who the, who the players are in the industry. The central government, of course, in Beijing, akin to Washington, D.C., they rule the entire country. Um, but very different, though. In China, you have local governments that report to central government. So, in, for example, in the United States, uh, California's governor, Jerry Brown, doesn't report to Barack Obama. Obama is not Jerry Brown's boss. Um, we, the citizens of California, who elected Jerry Brown, are technically his boss. He works for us, not for the president. In China, it, it is a hierarchy just like a corporation. The people on top rule the people below. So local governments at every level report up to the next government level up. Um, and central and local governments, in the context of the auto industry, both actually own automobile companies. Which brings me to the third bullet point, state-owned enterprises. These come in two flavors. There are centrally owned state-owned enterprises, and there are local state owned enterprises. Um, in the auto industry, there are four that happen to be the four largest automakers are owned by the central government. And then you've got dozens of smaller automakers owned by local governments. But you also have some private automakers that are not owned by the state. And this is what makes China interesting in this regard. Economic theory tells us if the government is the biggest investor in an industry. Private players will not invest. Government money will drive out private money. Why? You can't compete with the government. They can print money. But this presents us with another puzzle, because in China, we've got private automakers. And some of them are actually kind of big. Um, up in the, uh, the top dozen or so, you've got a couple of uh, pretty sizable private uh, automakers. But they're, they're not at the top. Um, and there's a big difference in how China treats state-owned and private companies. The state-owned companies get access to funding, they get preferential treatment in terms of policy. Um, the private companies, well, they kind of have to fend for themselves. They don't get the kind of access to banks. Um, if you work for a state-owned bank, which most of the banks are, are you going to lend to a state-owned company that has the guarantee of the government? Or are you going to lend to this private company that, well, has no government guarantee? That's a pretty easy decision to make if you're a banker. Finally, we have uh, foreign multinationals that are operating in China. And these are 
companies you know, General Motors, Ford, Toyota, BMW, Chrysler. Um, an interesting rule in China here is that foreign multinational automakers can't just go to China and open a factory and start building cars. They must be, they must do it in partnership with the Chinese automaker. They must have a joint venture, and they can't own more than 50% of the joint venture. That's kind of clever, right? Um, you've got these gigantic state-owned enterprises, and you force the foreign companies who come in to partner up with them, ostensibly to teach them how to build cars, right? So some knowledge certainly, um, you would think, changes hands. We'll see how that works. So to my first point <clears throat> about the model losing its effectiveness, in my book I've got a number of stories and case studies that sort of uh, support this. This one particular story I, I want to tell here really just has to do with the mix between Chinese branded cars and foreign branded cars. Um, the model, the industrial model in China, this model that is state dominated, has indeed been effective. Just looking from 2004 to 2012, this, this is only the past few years, growth in the automobile industry has just been astounding. Um, from 2001, when China joined the, the World Trade Organization, this drove competition domestically in China among automakers. Prices started to come down. Suddenly, millions of middle-class Chinese could afford a car for the first time. And they started buying cars, just like, just in, insanely quickly. It's amazing how fast this grew. Another big jump came between 2008 and 2009. You can see the big jump. Reach all the way to the end? Yes, it does. Um, the big jump between 2008 and 2009, um, what happened there was there was a stimulus plan uh, that came out of Beijing. Uh, 2009, what happened? <coughs> Global financial crisis started. The Chinese said, all right, well, we're not going to be victims of this. And what they did was they pumped nearly a trillion dollars into their economy, just money as fast as they could get it out the door. Part of this went to the auto industry in the form of subsidies for small cars. So if you bought a small car, you got a lot of money back from the government. It drove uh, sales of these small cars. Now, interestingly, at the time, most of these small cars were made by the Chinese auto companies. They were Chinese branded cars. So again, clever. It's a way to boost domestic, your domestic brands, right? And it worked. The, the size of that bar, the light blue bar between 2008 and 2009, grows uh, quite a bit. Um, but as you can see, if you look at then the thick red line toward the bottom, that thick red line, it's measured on the right-hand axis. Um, that is market share of Chinese branded cars. For some reason, <clears throat> the market share of Chinese branded cars has stagnated. And there's an important reason for this, and this really illustrates what's going on here. The model has been effective in terms of generating growth, but that growth has come only for foreign brands. The reason for this is the incentive differences between state-owned companies and private companies. People who lead state-owned companies are, for all practical purposes, politicians. They came out of politics to run a state-owned company. They'll work in that company for a while. They'll go back to politics. Maybe to, if they do a good job, they might become a vice governor, governor of a province, they might become a vice minister in Beijing. Um, but what this does is it makes them subject to the political cycle in China, which has nothing to do with economics, or shouldn't. The political cycle runs every five years. Every five years, there's a party congress on the years that end with two or seven. And that's the time at which all the jobs are shuffled. <clears throat> People get promoted or demoted in some cases. Um, and what this does is it makes the leaders of state-owned companies have a very short-term focus. They, they don't want to look very far into the future because who cares what happens after they leave? They want to know what do I do to make this company big and profitable as fast as I can in the next five years so I can get out of here and go on to my next job. Well, for an automobile company, that's not a good thing. To build a car, 
to design a car from scratch costs about a billion dollars. One car, about a billion dollars from the drawing board to the showroom. That, it takes a lot of guts to invest that kind of money because it's risky. Because not every car sells very well. You've seen some of them. Uh, Walter White drove a Pontiac Aztec during uh, the first early part of Breaking Bad. That was one of those that was a lot of money was invested, didn't sell very well. That was a pretty risky bet, right? Well, they, they don't want to take these kinds of risks. The state-owned companies don't want to take these kinds of risks. Um, and what, so what it, well then if, they, if they are designing their own cars, which I must say they do have some of their own Chinese branded cars, but they don't put any energy into them or marketing muscle. Why? Where are they making their money? With their foreign partners. They have foreign partners who bring their designs, their technology, their know-how. All the Chinese side does is contribute workers in a factory, and you sit back and collect your money. Because foreign cars, as you can see, sell very well in China. Well, what about the private companies? Then yeah, They make Chinese branded cars. They do. And in fact, that's all they make because they don't get to partner with the foreigners. So they have to invest. They have every incentive to invest for the long term. But as I mentioned before, they don't get to borrow the money from the banks to the same extent. So um, <clears throat> I think the best way to sum it up, an analyst in Hong Kong said to me, the, tr the real tragedy of China's automobile industry is you've got state-owned companies with money but no passion. You've got private companies with passion, but no money. And that's where you see the model beginning to fall apart. You can generate growth, but you only generate growth for foreigners. You don't generate growth for your own brands. And this is just simply one, one way that this is manifested in the auto industry. Now, the next point um, <clears throat> that uh, politics trumps economics. This is illustrated through a merger. Uh, SASAC is the central government. Um, it's the shareholder of all the central government uh, owned SOEs. Two of these SOEs are AVIC, which is an aviation company, and China South, which is a military company. Both of these companies, back in 2009, owned automobile companies. AVIC made an agreement with China South <clears throat> to sell AVIC to Chang'an Auto. Now this kind of makes sense, right? Um, they're an airplane company. Why, why do they have a car company? It makes sense to consolidate these two auto companies together. And so Chang'an Auto, when it bought Avic Auto, got Changhe, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use some Chinese words here, so I apologize, but Changhe Auto and Hafei Auto, um, and some engine and parts companies and all that. That, that all makes sense, right? It sounds like a pretty good thing. You take your small auto companies, put them all together, make one big auto company, you can achieve some efficiencies. And indeed, one thing that made sense was Changhe had a joint venture with Suzuki of Japan. And so did Chang'an. So it made sense for these two companies to come together. They could put together their Suzuki operations and save some money. Now, the NDRC, the National Development Reform Commission, China's economic planner, were behind this. They supported it and they said, this is a model. We want to see this happen all over our industry, all over, not just the auto industry, but all industries. Chinese industries want to get big. The bigger they get, the better they can compete with foreign companies. So this was a good thing. Except that um, in 2012, the people in Changhe decided to go on strike. And uh, it got kind of violent. They called in the People's Armed Police. Um, the, the sign here says, um, uh, Chang'an is not trustworthy. We don't want Chang'an, we want AVIC. We want to go back to AVIC. Um, why did they want to do that? Well, <clears throat> as you would expect, Chang'an said, all right, we've got a Suzuki joint venture and a Suzuki joint venture. Let's put them together. And so they said to Chang'e, which is about 700 miles to the east of where Chang'an was located. It's unfortunate, both of these start with a CH, and if you don't speak Chinese, they, they sound very much alike. Um, 
but Chong Ho was about 700 miles away, and they said, we're going to close the Suzuki uh, assembly line and move it to Chang'an in Chongqing, another stage, <laughs> um, 700 miles away. And, and these people got upset. Well, how did they resolve it? I mean, it's starting to get violent. Thousands of workers have walked out. What happened? How did they resolve it? The NDRC steps in. China's economic planner, who had supported this, who had been trying to get everybody to do mergers like this, they step in and say, resolve this strike, put the people back to work, do not close the Suzuki plant at Chang'e. This is where they made a decision. When push came to shove, social stability was deemed to be more important than economic growth. The logic of politics won over the logic of economics. So moving on to the central government getting what it wants. On that same theme of consolidation, of taking lots of small companies and putting them, get, putting them together to make big companies, um, China's actually had some success here. Just comparing the top five companies in the United States, auto, automobile industry, with the top five companies in the Chinese auto industry. The market share of the top five in the U.S., 68%. Market share of the top five in China, 72 So China's actually, in that regard, doing a little bit better, right? Now, these companies in the U.S. you've heard of, uh, the top one, of course, General Motors, um, adding to that the second one, Ford, um, and so forth. Um, in China, it's companies you've not heard of. Shanghai Auto, or maybe you have heard of them. Shanghai Auto, um, Dongfeng, First Auto, uh, uh, Chang'an, again. Chang'an moved into this list because of their purchase of, of the other companies. So China is getting its wish here. Consolidation of the auto industry has been a goal of the NDRC or its predecessor organization since the mid-80s. <clears throat> Back in the mid-80s, China had over 100 auto companies, which is just kind of insane, right? Nobody is going to get big enough to be competitive. Um, and in fact, it looks very much like the U.S. auto industry looked back in the 1920s. Um, surprisingly, like the U.S. auto industry. There were over 100 auto companies in the U.S. back in the 1920s. Um, the Depression took care of many of those. Um, so but what does it look like below the top five? Well, in the U.S., you've got 24 companies. Again, not a huge industry. Um, these smaller companies, you've probably even heard of some of them. Tesla certainly fits into that category. Um, a number of the European manufacturers as well. But what about China? I just told you back in the 80s they had over 100. And the central government since the 80s has had a central point of policy to shut down all these small, inefficient companies or merge them into big ones. Have they been successful? No. There are still 115 automobile companies. 30 years later, there are still 115. <clears throat> now, I'm trying to convince you that the central government still gets what it wants. I'm not doing a very good job, am I? <laughs> You've got consolidation and fragmentation in the same industry. So in a sense, they're getting what they want. But they're very much not getting what they want either, which is kind of strange. Now, what, how does this make sense? Well, let me explain why these 115 companies still exist. These 115 companies exist because they generate economic growth and they employ people. Economic growth, social stability. These small companies, about 80 out of 115, you can be certain, lose money. They are inefficient, they are unproductive, they are unprofitable. In the automobile industry, the rule of thumb is <clears throat> for a factory to break even, just to break even, you've got to produce 250,000 cars a year at least. There are about 80 companies in this list that don't even produce 20,000 cars a year. Mm -hmm. Yet, year in, year out, they stay open and they build cars. Why? Local governments have these incentives to perform, to generate economic growth and social stability. To look good to the people above them, they've got to generate economic growth. They could close those small companies, which would be the 
prudent thing to do. Or they could merge them with other big companies. But the beauty of, of GDP, and this gets back to why GDP is probably ultimately not the best measure of success. Selling a car adds to GDP. Losing money on that sale doesn't take away from it. So you can lose money all day long selling cars. As long as you sell them, that adds to GDP. And local governments have plenty of money to shovel into those companies. As they lose money, they just throw more money in there. They keep pouring money into it. They don't want to close these companies. They employ people. You put people out of work, you create potential stability problems for yourself. <clears throat> Local governments don't want the people in Beijing to look and say, how come you're having strikes all the time? How come you've got people on the, on the streets protesting? If people are working, they don't have time to protest. So, well then, but the central government wants consolidation, right? It's not getting what it wants, right? Where do the incentives for behavior come from for the local governments? They come from Beijing. People get promoted by doing what local governments have always done, which is to generate economic growth and keep stability as much as possible in their local regions. As long as they do that, they look good. So this is one of those instances when, if you dig a little further, you find that the central government is indeed getting what it wants. And this is quite amazing here. It's quite clever. And as long as you can afford this, it works. You get consolidation at the top. You got companies that are big and getting bigger that can compete with foreign companies. And at the bottom, you have sort of a welfare system that keeps people working. But again, as long as you can afford it, it works. There are questions, though, as to how long China can afford this. <clears throat> now, moving on to um, these final two points here. And then I'll start to bring it back up and talk about what it means um, in a macro sense. Um, foreign firms pay a price. Here we're talking about intellectual property. Um, this uh, Cherry QQ, <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's an interesting story about this. Um, and it's actually, a, I opened my book with this story. But the short, the short version of the story is that General Motors was getting ready to sell this Chevrolet Spark at the end of 2003. It's not on the market yet. <laughs> Six months before they're going to sell it, they start seeing this Cherry QQ driving around town. We haven't even sold our car yet. What's this? So they bought one. And they found, amazingly, you could take the doors off of the Cherry QQ and swap them with the Chevrolet Spark. This is amazing. The door on a car is a 3D space, right? It's not like a door to a room. It's, it's got to fit in all dimensions, right? <clears throat> the hinges lined up perfectly. The latch lined up perfectly. Well, clearly, chariots, they didn't just get a spark and copy it because they couldn't. It wasn't for sale yet. They got their hands on the plants. Well, uh, long story short, um, they settled out of court. Cherry didn't admit any wrongdoing. The Cherry QQ nowadays and the Chevrolet Spark nowadays don't look anything like each other. They've moved on. Um, Geely, a private company, um, the company that this cherry is actually a local state-owned company. Geely is a private company um, located in Zhejiang province. Made a really nice knockoff of the Mercedes C-Class, um, which, you know, if you're driving really fast, people think you're driving a Mercedes, which is kind of cool. <laughs> um, what do you think, when you see this, what, who do you think makes this? Any auto fishing homes? Toyota. Not Toyota. BMW. That's what I thought. Yeah. I, I took this picture at the Beijing Auto Show last year. When I, when I first saw this, immediately I thought, uh, oh, BMW. Yeah. No, wait, no, 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 no. There's this other sort of logo here in the middle. It's clearly not a BMW. Um, oh, actually, it looks better on that screen there. It's, here it's kind of squashed. Um, oh, yeah. There it looks more like itself. But <clears throat> um, yeah, this looks very much like a BMW X5. This is built by a company called China Brilliance. They're located in uh, Xinjiang, in northeast China. Guess who their joint venture partner is? BMW, yes. <laughs> um, now, <clears throat> this is kind of funny, it's kind of interesting, but I think what's fascinating here, if you look back in history, 
as I can assure you the Chinese have done. At the Industrial Revolution, the Germans looked across at what the British were doing and started to copy some of that stuff they were doing. The Brits weren't happy, but they didn't even do anything about it. Well, eventually, these young upstarts across the Atlantic, the Americans, started copying the Germans and the British. They weren't happy about it, but hey, we were getting big by then. There wasn't a lot they could do about it, right? Some, one day, the Japanese came along. They were copying everybody. The Chinese are doing exactly the same thing, have been doing the same thing. It's unfortunate for the Chinese, though, that by the time they've reached the point that they start doing this, we've sort of kicked away the ladder. We've built these robust international institutions, such as the World Trade Organization, that protect intellectual property. We've got these worldwide patent systems. So we're constantly yelling at the Chinese for doing the very things that the developed world did as we were coming up. The Chinese are sort of scratching their heads, saying, why are you guys so upset about this? And we're just doing what you did. Um, on the other hand, you learn by copying, right? That's how we got good at what we do. Um, and the Chinese are actually coming up with some pretty unique designs. I took this at Beijing Auto Show last year. This is an MG. You may remember the old MG. Brit. They're British, yeah. Um, probably not a lot of people in this room remember MG. <laughs> um, having an MG back in the 70s was really cool. They were imported from Great Britain, these little uh, two-seater roadsters. Um, anyway, Shanghai Auto has bought that brand. And this is one of the cars that they, it's a concept car. I mean, nobody has the guts to put suicide doors in a real car nowadays, which is a shame because they're really cool. Um, <clears throat> but it's a very interesting looking car. Um, and then this one by Cherry, the company that built the QQ. I thought this was interesting. Um, you look at the, um, the accent on the side, the way those creases flow to the back, sort of looks like it's being dragged through the water. I mean, so they're, they're coming up with, at least on the outside, some interesting designs. So they are improving. Um, oh, in this one, um, <clears throat> Transformers 4, you're going to see this car. This is a concept car built by Guangzhou. Auto. Um, in fact, they're filming Transformers 4 in Hong Kong right now. I saw some news about it this morning. <laughs> Somebody attacked the director. <laughs> oh. um, but anyway, so, so the Chinese are becoming more creative, at least in terms of the outside. Now, the insides of the car, there's not as much innovation going on, but there is some on the outside. And finally, um, the dilemma between the consumer aspirations and sustainability. Um, I'm not going to say any more about it than just to show you the picture. And if you've been to Beijing, you know what I'm talking about. It's awful. It's worse than LA ever was. But LA cleaned up. Maybe Beijing can too. They've got a much more difficult task ahead of them because it's a much smaller geographically, smaller, very densely packed, and everybody wants a car. Um, and I can talk some more about some of the efforts going on in China to deal with hybrids and electrics and that sort of thing. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to ask me about it in the q and I'll be happy to answer your questions at the end. So to answer this question, is China winning? Well, we can see that there is a, a conflict between economic logic and political expediency. There's no question about that. <clears throat> um, and one of the main theoretical reasons that state-owned enterprises shouldn't perform as well as, it, as private enterprises is this very reason. Right? This is one of the things that economists tell us should make state-owned enterprises perform poorly. So in this regard, China is not an exception. They're playing by the same rules. China has done a fantastic job of going from poor to middle income. But to get to the next level, the game has to change. You can only get so far being a good imitator. Beyond that, you've got to become innovative. Now, <clears throat> addressing these issues, this is where it gets tough. It requires political reform, not economic reform. Certainly, economic reform is needed, it's helpful, it's useful. But to go from a system in which the state sits atop the commanding heights of the economy 
and steps aside and allows the private sector to do what it does best. The private sector, who must innovate in order to stay alive, the state must step aside. But doing so means letting go of control. And that's a tough thing to do when your overarching unquestionable goal is continued rule of a single unelected party. China has new leaders now, and there's a real question. Are these guys political reformers? We believe that they are economic reformers. It's quite clear that they believe in economic reform. The question is, are they willing to make the political changes to take China to the next level? <clears throat> this new set of leaders came in in November. Um, these seven gentlemen are the standing committee of China's uh, Politburo. And the guy right in the center, Xi Jinping, is he's the president of China, and he's the secretary general of the Communist Party. <clears throat> standing right next to him is Li Keqiang. He's the prime minister, and uh, quite an astute economist. The leaders of China used to be revolutionaries way back when. <clears throat> Then they became technocrats, a lot of engineers. Now these guys are, we're starting to see lawyers and economists, <clears throat> which, I don't know, look at Washington and see where lawyers have gotten us. <laughs> um, but it's, you need people who understand the law, at least to some degree. Xi Jinping has a doctorate in law. <clears throat> so the question, though, is what are these guys going to do? What are the issues they face? Well, we, we've looked at the systemic weaknesses in the domestic system. And this is the part where my research was focused. <clears throat> the economic model that is now beginning to show its weaknesses. But they've got some other issues to deal with as well. Growth is slowing. They were accustomed to growing 10%, give or take, year in, year out. Now it's down to between 7 or 8%. <clears throat> Depending on how far they want to take reforms, it could drop further than that. Um, we would love to see 7 or 8% in the U.S. Um, I'll, frankly, that would be too fast for the U.S. I would think something was wrong if we, if we grew that fast. Um, <clears throat> local indebtedness. Local governments have now gone and borrowed, depending on estimates, because unfortunately um, China's not very forthcoming with the data. Estimates are anywhere between 1.5 to $3 trillion in debt held by local governments. And if you add up all of the revenues taken in by local governments, they're not even making enough money to cover the interest on all that debt, if the debt is as big as many people estimate. This could be a huge problem that's got to be dealt with. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a drag on the economy. Um, a demographic time bomb. China will be the first country in the world to grow old before it gets rich. By 2025, the population will stop growing. <clears throat> China has an inverse pyramid. Four grandparents, two parents, one child. And when you think of it that way, <clears throat> China at some point is going to have so many retired old people and not enough young workers to run the economy and to take care of those folks. Now this can be dealt with. There are measures that can be taken. The question is, are the leaders willing to let go of some of the controls that are in place now? We will see. Um, displeasure with local governments. Local governments, because they are indebted, and also because they just like to get their hands on as much money as possible, um, have been in some cases seizing land from farmers, relocating them. They, they give them some money, of course. Then they take that land and sell it to developers for a lot of money. <coughs> Um, which makes people angry. Um, and then there's this question of elite money. Um, nobody really knows the extent of this, but wealthy people in China, billionaires, gazillionaires, um, officials who have embezzled a lot, are putting money outside of China. We see anecdotal evidence of this. They're putting it in bank accounts abroad. They're buying real estate abroad. They're buying real estate in America. Um, that's one thing that's actually been driving up real estate prices. So if you already own, you can thank the Chinese for, for bolstering the market. Um, if you don't own yet, 
probably too late already. Um, <clears throat> they're also putting their families abroad in many cases, their, their wives and children, um, as sort of a, an escape route. Again, we don't know how big this is. It may not be a very big issue. Anecdotally, it could be signaling just uncertainty among people who are <clears throat> at the top of Chinese society. Internationally, discord with neighbors. These are things they've got to deal with. Islands in the East China Sea, islands in the South China Sea, border disputes with India, Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, North Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, India. Um, the number of countries that are in disputes with China starts to add up. <clears throat> um, China's recently, I think, begun to recognize this and has started trying to do a, a better job of, of trying to deal with these issues, but it's, it's a lot to have on their plate. Um, the U.S. pivot, for what that's worth, if it's even really a pivot, um, I kind of wonder, with Hillary Clinton having left office, is it, if it's still really a part of Obama's uh, policy. Um, and this last one's really interesting. China is now the world's biggest oil importer. <clears throat> and what does that mean? The United States has been heavily involved in the Middle East since World War II. Is it because we love the Middle East? It's because they've got something we like. They've got something we need. Like it or not, the economy runs on oil. And that has drawn heavy involvement of the United States in the Middle East. Well, surprise, surprise, um, here we are. It's now 40 years after the Arab oil embargo that, that sort of launched us in this direction. The United States is close to achieving energy independence. This is one of the best stories that has not been told. Due to fracking, due to horizontal drilling techniques, we're taking a lot of energy out of the ground in this country. Now, a lot of people aren't happy with what that's doing to the environment, and we recognize that. But it is decreasing American dependence on oil from the Middle East. Well, the biggest oil import importer is now China. And they may have to become more involved in the Middle East as the U.S. sees a reason to withdraw. Now this is in, in the future. We see no signs of this yet. <clears throat> but you can sort of see a scenario in which the U.S. may say, we don't really have much interest here anymore. And as the U.S. pulls out, we may see China decide, well, somebody's got, got to join here and keep things relatively stable so we can keep getting our energy needs. So that's just a, a possible. So Xi Jinping is the guy in charge now. Who is she? In December 2012, Xi Jinping was giving a speech commemorating the anniversary of China's constitution. Yes, China has a constitution. And it's actually a pretty good constitution. It's got all the rights you would expect to see. Speech, religion, all that good stuff. It's in there. Um, Xi Jinping said, no organization is above the rule of law or the Constitution. That's what she said. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, no organization is above the Constitution. The Communist Party is an organization, is it not? So everybody saw this and said, wow. This is huge. Finally, somebody is saying that even the Communist Party must also be under the Constitution, not above it. The, Com the Communist Party must also be subject to law. And so everybody began to think, wow, maybe Xi Jinping is some kind of a political reformer. Except <clears throat> the document got leaked in August, and it started to circulate in April. Document number nine, it was called for short. Those who are holding up the banner of defending the Constitution and governing the country in accordance with the law are attacking the party leadership because it is above the Constitution. <clears throat> now, these internal party documents, there's no way to know whether Xi Jinping himself wrote this. But these documents don't get circulated without at least the tacit approval of the head of the party. So publicly, Xi Jinping says nobody's above the Constitution. Privately, the party says, well, yeah, 
we are above the Constitution. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, if the party remains above the Constitution, then any kind of political change is going to be difficult. So what has the Xi administration done to date? Well, they're talking about economic reform, and next month there's going to be a party plenum, <clears throat> and I expect to see come out of that big meeting next month some economic reforms. We don't know how significant they'll be. Um, they have a, they've set up a free trade zone in Shanghai, uh, which is new. We don't know how well that's going to work yet, but that could be positive. They're cracking down on corruption and conspicuous wealth. Also a good thing. Um, <clears throat> I call this a petrol purge, and what that's about is uh, Petro China is one of the largest companies. It's an oil company. The oil companies in China are like ministries. They are so big and so powerful, they function almost as ministries unto themselves. <clears throat> They're untouchable, at least heretofore have been untouchable. Over recent weeks, they've been detaining, arresting, questioning, investigating the leaders of PetroChina and other people connected with it, including Zhang Jianmin, who's the head of SASAC, which is another important government organization. What does this mean? This organization has been untouchable until now, and suddenly they're cracking down on them. Now, corruption, yeah, probably. But the thing is, you ask anybody in China, who in Beijing is corrupt? They're going to tell you everybody's corrupt. It's only a question of who gets caught. So why are they picking on these guys? Well, if you want to scare people, pick on the big one. If you want to scare the rest of the state-owned enterprises into not resisting your reforms, pick on the big one, the oil companies. Now, that's just a guess on my part. I could be wrong. <clears throat> and we will see whether that means anything. But this could be a sign that there might be some political reform coming. People have used this term neo-Maoist to refer to some of the things that have been going on. So this is on sort of the bad side of the ledger. That document number nine I referred to, um, <clears throat> he's been, Xi Jinping has been going back to some of the old Mao era things like self-criticism. People get in the room and talk bad about themselves, tell everybody how horrible they are and where they've made mistakes and all that. Seems kind of strange to us, but this is actually quite common in China. Um, has been for, uh, for many years. So they've been doing a lot more of that and doing it publicly on TV. Um, they've been arresting a lot of dissidents recently. They've clamped down on online speech. People who have been saying things online that they don't like, they call them in to have tea. Um, and it essentially is, is a way to say, we're watching. We're watching what you do. Um, the seven speak knots. This, uh, these chika bujia, um, <clears throat> this was also part of document number nine. Universities have been ordered. They can't talk about these things. It's not that you can't say, okay, these are all Western and they're bad. They're told you can't even talk about them. You can't even bring up things like freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is in China's constitution. You can't bring it up. Judicial independence. You can't even bring it up to say that it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, so, the environment for innovation is kind of tough when you shut down all discourse about pretty much everything. So this is the last slide, and I'll wrap up. And <clears throat> so what does all this mean? So we've, we've started with this big question, are the Chinese winning? Just looking at the industrial model, um, it looks like we can see some weakness there. Um, some foreigners are getting rich off of China. Um, and some Chinese individually are certainly getting rich. What we're not seeing is a lot of innovation. Sort of that next step that needs to be taken to move into that developed status. Can China innovate? <clears throat> well, I mean, it's not that Chinese are incapable of innovation. If you look back in history, they were some of the world's earliest innovators. For about a thousand years, Chinese civilization was the peak. Chinese innovation and arts 
was the best in the world. <clears throat> While my ancestors were poking each other with sticks, the Chinese were writing beautiful poetry and inventing amazing things like uh, gunpowder and uh, the plow. I mean, if you didn't have these things and you suddenly have them, it's quite, it's quite an accomplishment. <clears throat> so it's not that innovation is something the Chinese lack. The question is, do, are the Chinese willing to create an environment that supports innovation? That's the real question. As long as the system disincentivizes innovation, you're not going to see a lot of real innovation come out of China. You'll see some imitation and some fast imitation. But are you going to see real groundbreaking innovation? <clears throat> well, if China unleashes its private sector, I think there's no question that you'll see innovation. As long as the private sector is marginalized, as long as it plays second fiddle to the big state-owned corporations, then you're not going to see the kind of innovation that the private sector would, on its own, crank out. Because the private sector is driven to survive. They're driven to please customers. They're driven to think ahead. And a system that rewards that <clears throat> incentivizes that behavior. But if these guys are sort of kept to the side and not allowed to really spread their wings, uh, the amount of innovation will be minimized. And the thing is, unleashing the private sector, again, it's a political question. It's not an economic question. It's a question of whether the Communist Party <clears throat> is willing to let go of those gigantic companies and allow the, the economy to run on its own. And it takes a lot of guts to, to make that step. Xi Jinping, whoever he is, and we really don't know yet, he's only one, one man who works in a consensus-based system that is designed to preserve party rule. So even if Xi Jinping, even if he meant the thing that he said, which is that nobody is above the Constitution, even if deep inside he is a secret reformer, even if all he wants to do is reform, and he's just keeping it under wraps for now, it's still going to be hard to do because he's surrounded by an entire system that is designed to preserve itself. So he's got to bring all these other guys with him. It's not his decision alone to make. It's those seven guys that we saw. They've got to agree. Some of those guys, we know for certain based on their history, are nowhere close to wanting to consider political reform. <clears throat> and the final thought I would add is that winning doesn't have to be zero-sum. The question is China winning. <clears throat> it might sound like a straw man, but frankly, I ask myself this question sometimes, especially given what we've seen take place in Washington over the last few weeks. I mean, if, certainly if the U.S. continues to shoot itself in the foot, well, <clears throat> it's not hard to see things uh, progressing very much in China's favor. But the fact is, because China wins doesn't mean other people have to lose, and vice versa. A strong and prosperous China is good for the world. And in fact, if the U.S. gets its political act together, I think we've demonstrated that we have in this country an innovative spirit and a spirit of entrepreneurship that we can compete with anybody. Not to get into American politics, which is not what my talk about. Is my, that's not what my talk is about. Um, but I think there's room for everybody to win. And with that, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure speaking to you.